And as I finalize, I would like to state that even though the impeachment process is a quasi-judicial process, my lord, it is governed by the rule of law, which we are all called upon to uphold. Yes. I do not wish to stretch any further. I wish to rest my submissions there. Thank you very much, my lord. Yes, the second interested party made an application to be joined as an interested party to these proceedings on 5th September 2024. In the hearing conducted on 24th and 25th of September 2024, by consent, it was agreed that the interested party uh, to be allowed to be part of the proceedings. These submissions that I'm here to present dated on 2nd October 2024. Yeah. Are made, um, are made in support of the petitioner's application dated 21st August 2024 and in opposition of the respondent's application dated 3rd September 2024. Yeah. Secondly, I associate with the submissions uh, by the petitioner and the first interested party and therefore will be very brief so as not to repeat what has already been said. For that reason, I will go straight to the issues that the second interested party put forward for determination in the matter. So yes. the first issue is whether the petitioner has met the threshold, the threshold for issuance of conservatory orders. Secondly, is whether the ex parte conservatory orders issued on 21st August 2024 ought to be reviewed, varied, set aside and or discharged and third who bears the cost of this application to the first issue is whether the petitioner has met the threshold for issuance of conservatory orders i do not wish to repeat the principles that have been stated by the petitioners council however i wish to highlight that conservatory orders are granted on the inherent merit of a case bearing in mind public interest, the constitutional values, and the pro proportionate magnitude and priority levels attributed to the relevant case. Further, conservatory orders are issued, um, rather, are issued in exercise of the discretion of a court. Yes. The second interested party relied in, on the case of Gatirao Peter Munya versus Dixon Mwenda Kitinji and two others. Uh, that's at 20, the citation is 2014 EKLR for the courts that have made on yes. the conservatory order being public in nature. And therefore, what is more important in this case is that 
the constitutional edit to be protected and that it be observed by members of the Senate and of the county assembly elected as representatives of Kenyans, the citizens of Kenya. Therefore, misuse of such powers that the members of the county assembly and the Senate have should not be allowed by the court. It is on this premise that uh, we implore the court to uphold the conservatory orders and that the same to not be set aside. On to my second issue on the exercise of discretion by the court. My Lord, the court is alive to the social constructs in Kenya, the patriarchy in our societies, and the general dynamics of our society. Did Fida file an affidavit? No. So I think we can uh, we just skip, skip the observations about the general nature of our society. Yes, they are founded on an affidavit. Those we cannot uh, read and revive. I am guided. Um, having said that, that is the end of my summary. You don't learn that. I can't teach you, of course. You don't learn that. I adopt um, the submissions and uh, pray that the court uh, rely on those in determining the matter of costs. Thank you, Your Lordship. Allow me on behalf of the third interested party to urge you, Your Lordship, while the conservatory orders were not deserved and ought to be discharged. My Lord, you rely on our written submissions dated the 30th of September 2024. 30th September 2024 and the case laws embedded on those submissions in Yes. My Lord, I will submit to you on three limbs. The first is on public interest. My Lord, the second is on the question of negatory. And my Lord, Lastly, on the balance of convenience. My Lord, my departure point is Article 1 of our Constitution, yes. and which, my Lord, provides that uh, all the sovereign power belongs to the people. <clears throat> and my Lord, under Sabbatical 2, the people are allowed to exercise that sovereign power either directly or through the elected representatives. Yeah. My Lord, the people of Meru County, through the elected representatives being the members of the county assembly, yeah. elected to impeach their governor. Yeah. My Lord, the proprietor of the procedure which they followed was clear, and I believe it has been well explained by the respondent in this petition. My Lord, public interest, I would want you to be guided on what the Supreme Court has said in petition number 10 and 11, consolidated of 2024. That is the case of Dock Workers Union and Okio Motata, as as KPA and others. Yes. And your Lordship, the Supreme Court was very, very candid.
at the third ground that a court should consider while granting or denying conservatory orders is the impact of such orders beyond the parties to the case and should the order be granted or denied what is the maintain the conservatory order as this petition is going to be rendered negatory. My Lord, we humbly submit that the position of a governor with all due respect to Lordship is not personal to any individual. It is a constitutional office. The holders of that office are public officers within the meaning of the law. Yes. My Lord, no person can cling or individualize the position of a governor. As such a lordship, the law provides for mechanisms of removal of a governor. And that is exactly what has happened in the matter before you, my Lord. My Lord, it is tried and the court was kind enough to read our mind, which is also in our submissions, that indeed, even if the governor was to be found to have a meritorious petition before you, yes. you have powers to reinstate her to office. My Lord, you have powers to order that she be paid damages. My Lord, again, you have powers to issue any appropriate orders that will remedy her as a person of the governor. My Lord, as such, Article 182, sub Article 2 of the Constitution also, provides why there will be no vacuum. Because a deputy governor will be able to take office and discharge the functions of a governor. As such a lordship, there is no issue of negatory or the petitioner or the petition being read out negatory before you because the law has provided safeguards, sufficient safeguards over such a matter. <coughs> yes. My lord, if you allow me again, uh, I had my colleagues submit that there is no way of dealing with a deputy governor who presumes office. And my lord, I would want to refer him to Article 182, sub Article 6 of our Constitution, yeah. which provides that a deputy governor can as well be removed. Article 182, clause 6. Sub Article 6. Yes. Which, my Lord, provides that a deputy governor can as well be removed if he does not act within the Constitution provisions. My Lord, You've also been told that the petition will be rendered negatory because 
the county executive uh, committee and the cabinet will be kicked out of the office because the governor has been impeached. <coughs> My lord, with all due respect, that position is inaccurate. Those persons are a constitutional office holders elected or nominated or given that power passed to legal provisions in fact their terms run for five years and my lord the mayor deputy governor does not mean that those persons will as well go home My Lord, you've also been urged that uh, in regard to Section 33.8 of the County Government Act, and my Lord, is a humble submission before you that that provision of the law enjoys the presumption of constitutionality. My Lord, in any event, and with all due respect again, the issue of Section 338 in Meru, which is still pending and which has not been prosecuted. My Lord, with all due respect, without going into the facts of the matters and interested party, you are urged that there was an existing court order barring the impeachment process. My Lord, our first question is, was the Senate a party to those proceedings? My Lord, our second question is, if he did there were proceedings that barred the impeachment process, as the petitioner filed in the content application in that court, and my Lord, if they want you to deal with the issues of Section 33.8 of the County Government Act, yeah. have they sought a consolidation of the two petitions so that this court is then embodied to deal with that issue? But Lord, with all due respect, we feel that those facts have not been brought before you in the proper way, and you are being enjoined, and you are being misled with all due respect where there is not material disclosure of the proper facts on the ground and upon which your Lordship was misled to issue a conservatory order. But Lord, as I wind up argument on that point, I wish to remind the, uh, ourselves that the term of the petitioner as an elected uh, governor is not indefinite. It's only limited to five years. The law anticipated that that term can be stopped or curtailed through a legal process. That is what has happened, Your Lordship, and there is nothing illegal about that. As such, the petition before you cannot be said that it will be rendered negatory when a legal process has taken place. My Lord, allow me to go into the question of balance of convenience. Yes. Your Lordship, allow me to pose a question. What would happen if Your Lordship maintains the conservatory orders in this matter and eventually finds that the petition before you is not merited? My Lord, the people of Meru, the voters of Meru, one of whom I represent before you, will continue the suffering they have endured since the governor took office and they are enduring in the current stalemate in Meru County Madam and your lordship. Madam, apologies, I object to that. A learned colleague like my other learned colleague did file an affidavit. The question of people of Meru suffering is a purely factual issue that can only be brought to the attention of this court. 
from submitting was such a factual issue without credibility. Because we want to know the particulars of suffering, but that we deal with them one by one. Really? Yes, Your Lordship. Uh, please limit yourself to the scope of your submissions. Thank you, my Lord. I will limit myself, I allow your Lordship to look at the facts from the parties who have filed affidavits of fact. Thank you. My Lord, on the balance of convenience, I was submitting that in the event that you find that this petition was not merited, and by that time, uh, the voters of Meru County uh, will have endured the lack of a proper governor for the county. And that, my Lord, with all due respect, Mr. yes, my Lord. Um, Mr. Ngoya has not raised his feet, but uh, I think you can agree what that. Thank you, my Lord. <laughs> Thank you, my Lord. Okay. Thank you, my Lord. My Lord, allow me to leave that and move to my second uh, limb of argument. Why the balance of convenience, uh, my Lord, we feel that uh, favors the lifting of the conservatory orders. Yes. My Lord, we humbly submit that uh, it will have been, with all due respect, unfair to the people of Meru County to have endured a process whereas they could have sworn in their deputy governor and proceeded with the management of the county affairs while the governor finds justice in the petition before you without a conservatory order being in place. My Lord, with all due respect, we also want to look in the question of the status quo. Mr. Yes, Your Lordship. Um, if I'm to understand that point that uh, you just made, you're saying that there is a balance of convenience where each party, each side gets something. So the voters get a, uh, a new governor, the petitioner gets to argue their case, and at the end of the process, if the court reverses the decision and the actions are made, so be it. If not, then no harm is done. Is that what you say? A lot. We are saying more than that, in that in the event the court finds that the petition is also merited, it is clothed with sufficient uh, means of remedying the governor. It can order damages, it can order a statement, it can issue appropriate orders, your lordship, that will assuage the governor. I'm trying to see how we can frame this without having to fight enough. Because we do represent an interested party who is admitted because they are a voter. Perhaps it is it is impossible. Thank you, Lordship. Thank you, thank you, Lordship. My Lord, I, I wish to also submit that uh, the question of status quo, as 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 escalating from the Senate, yes. and as escalating from the members of the County Assembly of Meru, who are not parties in these proceedings, yes. is that their governor stands impeached. Yes. My Lord, in my humble view, the balance of convenience tilts in favor of maintaining the status quo that has been adjudicated by at least another arm of government. Yes. My Lord, we further urge you that the Facts, and if you allow me, this goes to the issue of joinder, which we've also submitted on. The fact that your lordship, the members of the county assembly, were not enjoined in these proceedings, neither was the Senate itself enjoined in these proceedings. We humbly submit that that omission is fatal for the following reason. Yes. My lord, the mover of the motion of impeachment. The owner of the motion of impeachment is the people of Meru through their elected representatives. With all due respect, Your Lordship, they are the mothers of the motion. My Lord, failing to enjoin them in the proceedings before you, we humbly submit was mischievous with due respect to my colleagues. And Your Lordship, I wish to distinguish the case that was cited before you. 
my name is Kwadi, but the Speaker of National Assembly, but as the Center for Rights of Educational and Awareness, and seven others. Yes. Lord, that particular matter before the Court of Appeal did not emanate from impeachment proceedings. Yes. My Lord, the role of Senate in impeachment proceedings is unique and peculiar. My Lord, the role of the members of the County Assembly again in the impeachment process is also quite unique. Yes. In such a lordship, the non joinder of parties in that particular matter where the court said did not go to the issue, did not uh, affect the fundamental rights of the parties, cannot be the same as a matter involving impeachment of a governor. In the such a lordship, that matter is not on all fours like the matter before you and is quite distinguishable. Mm -hmm. I lot through your submissions yes, sir, sir. and also those of the respondent, yes, sir, sir. there was um, quite some ground covered as to prejudice. Where essentially, this court is being invited to interrogate the constitutionality of parties that are not before this court. Now, you've alluded to it being the Senate and then the County Assembly. Can this court safely give orders at the end, or even at the interlocutory stage, that affect parties that are not before this court? My Lord, we humbly submit that this court should not issue orders affecting parties who have not have had an opportunity to espouse their position before you. Dear Lordship, I wish to remind the petitioner perhaps that the person they have sued, that is the Speaker, does not even hold a voting right in Senate. So the Speaker is not per se directly the owner of the motion that went on to impeach the Governor. The real people who impeached the Governor is the Senate and the members of the County Assembly from Meru whom my client participated in electing. Your Lordship, uh, allow me to also submit on just one issue, the one you request. You asked about mischief, and I think we had submitted a bit on it. That, uh, that is your time. But I'll Thank you. More. Thank you, Your Lordship. Thank possible. you for indulging me. Thank you. My Lord, uh, with due respect, the Senate understanding orders 111 for so the mischief that can be perpetuated. Can be perpetuated the Senate at standing order? 111. Yes. For so the mischief that can be perpetuated during a motion of impeachment, like the one that emanated the proceedings before you. And as such a lordship, they limited the question of the debate of that motion. And again, in the wisdom of Senate and our constitutional makers, they also gazetted the days and the timelines for, de for debating such motions. Leadership, I'm trying to go around the issue that was raised by the petitioners, that there was communication that came out uh, erroneously without appearing to go into the facts of the issues. And my Lord, we humbly submit that that issue is humbly covered by the Respondent, and that mischief was cured, and that is why the communication and to come on the 20th of August, it was time froze, whether it was midnight or past midnight, time froze until the motion was debated and concluded. Finally, Your Lordship, with all due respect, allow me to associate fully with the submissions made by the respondent before you and urge your Lordship to kindly vacate and set aside the conservatory orders that are in place and that have made the people of Nero continue suffering. My Lord, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's catching up. Thank you.
to the police. I don't think 10 minutes will be sufficient. Let me try. Let me give you 20. I appreciate it. But try to keep it under. Thank you so much. And it is rejoined. Thank you. For direct responses to what for the 20 minutes, I will use uh, 15 minutes. My learned colleague, Mr. Mutuma, will use five minutes. Let me go straight to the point. But I, let me begin by asserting that it is sound principle in constitutional interpretation that a constitution must be read as a whole. Let me just begin by asserting that as a principle and make the following then terms of rejoinder. It has been said that what is at issue here is the sovereign power of the people of Meru. Let me summarize that as the issue. To that, we respond as follows. That it is true that all sovereign power first belongs to the people of Kenya with a rider that it shall be exercised only in accordance with this constitution. Only in accordance with this constitution. The petitioner is telling you that this rider has been violated. That's what the petitioner is telling you. This rider has been violated. That this power has been exercised in violation of this constitution. Yes. The second issue that has arisen is that, that the petitioner has no, may I call it, private or proprietary interest in the office of governor. A submission was made to that effect. Yes. Again, let me read Article 38, Clause 3, Paragraph C of the Constitution. Article 38, Paragraph 3, uh, sorry, Article 38, Clause 3, Paragraph C. It says, every adult citizen has the right without an or office of a political party of which is a member and I have a constitutional entitlement to hold office unless I am constitutionally removed. And he's saying the removal here is unconstitutional. We are making an argument, my lord. Whether or not it was or it was not constitutional is a matter for trial in the main petition. But we are saying in the meantime, in the meantime, let us stop disturbing the status quo. Let us hold the matters as they are. I'll address you on this issue of status quo because it may be an issue by my colleagues on the other side shortly. Yes. Number three, again, my learned colleague for the third interested party and Iterated the issue of joinder of the speaker and the speaker having no voting at paragraph 57. 57 of the judgment in the case of the speaker of the National Assembly versus the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness. Where paragraph, 50. paragraph 57. Paradoxically, the argument was precisely the same argument. It went. I would read it, my lord, without asking you to regurgitate it, just for a full tenor. The appellant, understandably, as we do here, protests that the speaker has no role in initiating bills and does not even possess a vote in support of or opposition to a bill. And for that reason, he cannot be sued by the failure by parliament to discharge a constitutional mandate to pass legislation. Same thing here. The speaker will bring the motion, does not vote on it, and they have, what does the Court of Appeal answer? The Court of Appeal answers, in our view, where it is alleged that the National Assembly or the Senate has violated the Constitution, the Speaker is a proper respondent for the following reasons. Then from paragraph 58 through 59, reasons are given. Same argument, same principle. My colleague says he wants to distinguish. How? The Court 
Article of Appeal is saying, in our view, where it is alleged that the National Assembly or the Senate has violated the Constitution, the Speaker is a proper respondent. The petitioner is saying, in relation to her, the Senate has violated the Constitution. The Court of Appeal is answering, the correct respondent is the Speaker. And let me ask my colleagues the question I've asked other colleagues before. Let's assume they are right. And you are sitting there, my Lord, with a court of appeal in front, decision in front of you as well. What do they want you to do? What do they possibly want you to do? I think sometimes, as Jesus Christ said, it is written that they shall not put me to temptation or something like that. <laughs> what do they want you to do, possibly? Having said that, let me move to another argument. The question is, what is the status quo? Uh, and before I go to that, my lord, allow me to finish that point of joinder. Let me just finish that point of joinder before I go to that point. Yes. What is the prejudice that the respondent in this matter has possibly suffered by joinder of the speaker? We submit none. For example, the replying affidavit to the application for conservatory orders and to the main petition was prepared and sworn by Mr. Jeremiah Nyegenye, clerk of the Senate. Meaning, the respondent clearly understood that he was sued on behalf of the Senate, and that's why he chose a competent officer of the Senate to prepare the affidavit and file it. I want to finish that point by saying that that repeated argument has no justicial priorities. Yes. I had made out an argument now that of August 2021, the Senate passed a resolution to remove the governor of Meru from office by impeachment. Yes. It is also true that under Article number 23, Clause 3, Paragraph C of the Constitution, this court has constitutional power to issue a conservatory order. And therefore, these two powers were exercised. Parliament exercised its power under Article 181, Court exercised its power on 21st of August 2024 under Article 233C. The proper question then is this. These two powers having been exercised by these constitutional institutions, what is the status quo? And the answer becomes the status quo pursuant to the conservatory order issued by this court is what we call the status quo ante, the status quo preceding that action of the Senate. So what is that status quo? Honorable Kawira Mwangaza was and remains the governor of Meru County. It has been alleged that there was material non-disclosure or that this court was misled in making the conservatory order of 21st of August. First, my lord, you know, in my other world, I'm a teacher. And I get disturbed a little when things are made that disturb my intellect. Yes. The order from the High Court in Meru was produced and attached to the petitioner's affidavit as an extra KM3. It was produced and given to you. Yes. There is a strong presumption that you read that order yourself, given to you. And issued an order. How can the petitioner 
who has presented the full ruling of the court be accused of material non-disclosure. I kept telling my colleague, Mr. Mutuma, I need school, new schooling on non-disclosure. There can be no better disclosure than actually presenting the physical copy of the ruling for the court to read by itself. Let me then get to the second limb of this argument. <clears throat> the court in Meru began by framing the issue before it. Then it gave an order. Let's see the issue as framed and the order as given. If you, when you look at Annex KM3, at paragraph 1, the court said, this court... I hope my, 20, my few minutes are frozen. Yes. Thank you so much. Begins at page nine. Correct. Correct. Yes, I'm there. That's really. If you can, it says this court has to make a decision as to whether to grant interim orders or preserve a status quo or not. So the issue before the court is not limited to a particular motion. The issue is whether to preserve. Not. Then, if you got now page twelve, huh, which is now page four of the ruling, yes. page four of the ruling, the court then makes the order. The upshot of the above is that the impeachment process is halted, not the impeachment motion. The impeachment process is halted. The court is saying, I'm halting the process to preserve the status quo. How can my colleagues say that this was not an order before this court? While at it, if you look at the supplementary affidavit of the governor, both at paragraph 8 of that affidavit and an extra BKM2 to that supplementary affidavit. Yes. The moment the county assembly approved the impeachment motion, learned counsel for the governor, Mr. Mutuma, wrote to the speaker of the Senate, drawing the speaker's attention to this court order. The letter you'll see on the face of it is stamped by the speaker, who is the respondent, and stamped by the clerk, who is the deponent of the affidavit of the respondent. Yes. My lord, how can my learned colleague make an argument that the speaker was not a party to that suit? Doesn't the speaker of the National Assembly have an obligation under article... My apologies, the speaker of the Senate, yes, have an obligation under articles... 10 of the Constitution to uphold the national value of the rule of law by virtue of his office. How can a speaker who knows of a court order as was done in this case and continues to allow debate in violation of that court order come and claim I was not a party to those proceedings? I mean, that is bad governance in a class of its own. It is good governance stops it, Tavi. It should not have been done in the Senate. It was done. It should not have been done in this court by officers of this court. They must join us in frowning upon this conduct of these two officers because our own oath of office as advocates gives us obligations beyond our clients, which is an obligation to uphold the rule of law. So, my lord, You will see at a second level the response by the governor in response to the motion at the Senate. She made that claim that they are pending court orders. You will see the debate by Senator Haluale in the proceedings of the Senate. He asked the Speaker to consider that all those things are in the affidavit in support of the main petition. And therefore, anyone to argue there was no court order 
uh, that is not being very candid with this court. And, and that should be, should be from. For the completeness of my record. Yes. The, um, the ruling, let's bring it back up. The ruling date is 24th July 2024 by my brother Kassan J. Yes. It concludes. Yes. This is page 12 of your bundle. Yes. The upshot of, of the above is that the impeachment process is halted. Yes. Pending my ruling, yes. And since this is a matter of public interest, yes. the rulings into brackets, yes. PO, interested parties and main petition will yes. be delivered on Monday, the 29th day of July 2024. Yes. By email to all parties. parties yes. Was this ruling delivered? No, it wasn't delivered. In fact, the judge recused himself from the matter before the ruling was delivered, and the ruling was subsequently delivered by your brother, Justice Murivi long after this impeachment process, dismissing the PO. Yes. Yes. Uh, my Lord, I don't know. Just, just check, check the page after that ruling. Is there an order of court dated 29th July? Order, yes, that one. That's what transpired on the 29th. Whatever you see there is what transpired on the 29th. Yes. Yes. And you'll notice that huh, the ruling was deferred 20th August by Order 5. Is that ruling dismissing the PO? Is it uh, is it before me? No, it is not. It happened quite recently, long after this petition was filed. I'm just trying to remember the day, but it's, it's a, a, a much subsequent development. Long after we filed this petition, this application, I just answered it because my lord, you raised it. Mr. Okay, would you have an objection to the petition of filing that ruling so that I can see it? In reality, I can, I, can, uh, I can obtain it, but that is not the proper way of doing it. It should be placed properly, because there's been a lot of reference to that process and what it is. Should we have that ruling before this court? I will not object to that. I will not have the question. Correct. Just. Yes, no problem. No, no arguments. No arguments. Yes. You don't even need to put it in an affidavit. Yes. You just file it in CTS. Correct. And you serve your funds as electronically. Correct. Don't worry, your time had been frozen. Frozen. Yes. Allow me just su to submit on the on the question of prejudice because that again has been raised. And if you look at the Munya decision, the Munya decision, which is I think to my mind, the locus classicus on uh, the question of conservatory orders. Yes. The Supreme Court gives us guidelines on granting conservatory orders. We must look at the impact of the decision beyond the petitioner. That's essentially what the Supreme Court is telling us. And let's just try to reflect on this, the legal consequences of not preserving this conservative order. Article 179, Clause 9. Yes. Article 179, Clause, my apologies, Clause 7 of the Constitution says, if a vacancy arises in the office of the county governor, the members of the county executive committee appointed under Clause 2B cease to hold office. So, so this is a legal consequence. When my colleagues say they can continue, how? They don't say they must stop holding office. Let's, let's try to think about the public interest on this, my lord. It will mean yes. 
the deputy governor once sworn in then must appoint new CECs because those others stopped holding office by operation of law. It's not a discretion on the part of the governor. Hiring those new CECs means, my lord, taking them through the vetting process at the taxpayer's expense, the approval process at the taxpayer's expense. It means replacing now the deputy governor, because the deputy governor has assumed the office of governor. It means replacing a deputy governor now at the taxpayer's expense. When my colleague keeps saying the governor can be compensated, who will compensate these taxpayers? This is irreparable damage, my lord. This is the, I've never seen more irreparable damage than that. They will come into office, they will be entitled to the usual things, medical cover, their mortgages and grants, if any, provided by SRC. These, these, these are all consequences. So that if you eventually return the governor to office, it also follows that that deputy governor who assumed office of a governor has vacated office, those CECs also vacate office. The governor again begins another process of hiring CECs and other senior bureaucrats. I'm just looking at the legal consequences only. Yes, I, I, I appreciate it. If these conservatory orders were lifted, yes, and then the petition succeeds, yes, they would need, there would be need in the orders mm -hmm. for the CEC members yes. who have come in, yes, to be removed. Correct. The new DG, yes, to be removed. Correct. And the status quo ante, correct, to be reestablished. Correct. That is your submission. That's my submission, and I'm just saying by operation of law. It's not, it's not, there's no discretion because my colleagues kept saying that who said he must remove the CEC the law itself says uh, once this one leaves office those CECs leave office they can only come back to office by reappointment and my, my lord when you, you, you begin reappointing it's a, it's a fresh appointment it's like the other day my lord when the president removed CSS from office and now I'm just giving a parity. I'm just giving an example. I'm, I'm giving a, a matter in the in the, the notorious apologies. Okay, I'll leave it at that. But I'm saying by operation of law, Article 1797, they must go, then get re appointed or fresh was appointed by the DG who assumes the governor. Then assume the petition succeeds. Those ones whom the DG had appointed must also go by operation of law, Article 1797. Then the governor returns to office and begins another appointment process. I'm making a simple argument, my lord. This is overwhelming expense to an already burdened taxpayer in Meru, like all of us. Yes. Compare that, my lord, to a matter that is within our control completely, where we can break our backs in this court and say in the next one month, in the next two months, we must finish hearing this petition so that the chips fall, chips fall into their place. This is 